Welcome to the 2023 update webinar, which is brought to you by the Australian Fungicide Resistance Network, also known as AFRIN. I'm Dr. Anna Sheree Griffer, AFRIN coordinator. And in this, in this session, we have Dr. Steve Markcroft, who will be presenting information around the economics of black, black leg fungicide application as it relates to early bloom. Now, AFRIN is a GRDC supported initiative that delivers a platform of up-to-date resources and information directly to Australian growers, agronomists, and advisors. These resources can be found at the site afrin.com.au and includes a fungicide resistance management guide. We also have regionally specific workshops, fact sheets, webinars such as this one, podcasts, updates, and more. By engaging with our top plant pathologists and extension and communication experts in the field, we aim to keep you alert to the increasing problem of fungicide resistance, particularly in grain crops. We hope that by arming you with knowledge, you'll feel confident with making informed decisions on best management practices for crop success, not only now, um, but in the future as well. So for some housekeeping, Thank you. Um, if you have a question, could you please uh, click on the Q&A and enter your question below? We aim to get to these questions at the end of the session. Um, so please, you know, if you've got something that you'd like to know, um, we should have a, a bit of time after Steve's presentation. So I now hand you over to Steve, one of our leading experts in the field of canola and black leg disease here in Australia. Steve has decades of experience, and I hope you don't mind me saying that, Steve, and I'm not showing your age, um, but honestly, I'm leaving you in the best of hands with Dr. Steve Marcroft. So Steve, if you would like to take it away. Okay, thanks, Bert Shree. Um, yeah, it looks like we've got a really great turnout for today, which um, probably reflects the number of phone calls I'm getting from agronomists at the moment about spray decisions and black leg. But firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge this is a GRDC funded project. So the data and results we'll be talking about now are really from the last five years of that investment. Um, you can see the team that we've got across Australia on the screen there. Now, I'm just gonna bring up my laser pointer. So the first thing I want to talk about, so today I'm really talking about the decision that you're going to make right now or in the next couple of weeks, um, which is the 30% bloom fungicide application decision. And the first thing I want to know is that it's not just one disease that we control with this application. Firstly, there is Alton area. Alton area obviously has been very, very bad in a lot of Australia over the last couple of years. Alton area is a disease that turns up late in the growing season. It comes in really fast and then becomes very severe, very fast. I really associate it with La Nina years when we get a lot of rainfall post um, flowering, so stripped directly onto the pods. Um, and it can cause a lot of yield loss, primarily through premature pod shattering. The issue from a spray decision is that Really, the chemistries that we've got for black leg and sclerotinia can control Alton area, but because of MRL issues, we can't spray them directly onto the pods. We spray them you know, during the flowering time. So for early outbreaks of Alton area, I think there is some indication that we can get some control with that 30% bloom spray, but really in the years where Alton area is bad, it's those late rainfalls like last year, um, we're unlikely to get much control with that 30% bloom spray. But it's good to know that occasionally we will get some sort of effect. The next one I've got there in the middle is the powdery mildew. Powdery mildew appears to be becoming a bigger issue in canola. I'm not really sure why or whether we're just looking for it more, but it does become quite widespread. Whether or not it causes any yield loss, we really don't know. But what we have observed is that the 30% bloom sprays, which we're putting on for black leaf, give excellent control of powdery mildew. So it's not something that I'd recommend you actually go out and specifically control for, but it is nice to know that um, those 30% bloom sprays, which we're putting on anyway, um, are giving really nice control of powdery mildew. The next one, which is obviously a disease which we do actively control for 30% bloom spray is sclerotinia, and I will talk about that one now. 
So sclerotinia is a bit of a bugger of a disease. And the reason for that is we never know how bad it or not it's going to be. So the way sclerotinia works is you have resting bodies in the soil, which can survive up to 15 years. So it's very hard to control sclerotinia rotation. But these resting bodies, when the conditions are right in late winter, will start producing these mushrooms um, called apothecia. The mushrooms release airborne spores. They land on our um, canola petals. They use that petal as initial food source. When those petals fall and they get stuck in the leaf axles there, the sclerotinia then grows out of the petal into the leaf, which you can see there. And then eventually they'll grow into the stem. And if that infection continues, it'll um, cause that stem rot, which we see. And it's that stem rot there, which is causing all the yield loss. The issue with sclerotinia is that this initial phase of the, the mushrooms forming, the spores being released, the petal infection occurring is very well understood and is very predictable. We know when it's occurring, know that it's there, but this isn't actually the yield damaging part of the disease. What has, to, what has to have occur is for that disease to grow from the petals into the stem. And this is where sclerotinia is very poorly understood. Um, and it's poorly understood in you know, every continent of the world and every crop as well, because sclerotinia can, the same pathogen can infect something like 400 different species of broadleaf crops or weeds, pastures, etc. And I guess this is where, from a, from a grower's perspective, it becomes really hard to manage to say, well, I know I've got sclerotinia, but is it actually this year going to form that, um, that stem rot? So if we go through that, Kurt Lindbeck has done most of this work in New South Wales DP, DPI, talks about all the stars must align. There's a number of stars, um, and if any one of them is missing, the disease doesn't progress to the stem rot stage. Um, however, in saying that, in regions like southern New South Wales, northeast Victoria, which do regularly have infections, these outbreaks, the triggers are well known and are used um, quite well. However, in other regions like southern Victoria, South Australia, etc., we don't have um, that, that really good knowledge. So, for instance, we were monitoring six sclerotinia or canola paddocks last year for Kurt. Five of them had low levels of sclerotinia and one got actually smashed with sclerotinia. And, um, and according to all the weather and the tiny tag data we had out in the field, they all appeared to have really good infection events. And Kurt said that in southern New South Wales, he would have expected them all to have high levels of sclerotinia. But in our region, we only got um, five out of the, sorry, one out of the six, which hit that. We don't know why that's the case. The good news with sclerotinia is um, there now is the sclerotinia app, which is called sclerotinia CM. Um, and this is really a spray decision tool for sclerotinia. So the way it works, it's an economic app. So you can look at your target yield, you put in your grain price, cost of production, et cetera. And then from a sclerotinia perspective, you put in how many broadleaf crops you've had in the last 10 years, because that'll be the source of the inoculum, those little fruit resting fruity bodies that form the mushrooms. And then rather than us trying to predict how much sclerotinia you'll get in any given season, you as agronomists really need to have a good idea about your particular paddock. So when you're looking at a paddock, you'll know the history of that paddock. You'll know if sclerotinia has been a problem in the past. You'll know if it's just a problem in those really wet years like last year or 2016, or you'll know if it just turns up very occasionally. Um, so you'll basically spin that dial there and then you'll determine how much of a risk that paddock's at. And then this is really the powerful part of the app. This is the spray decision um, tool part of the app. So you're standing in the crop and you'll actually put in what is the growth stage of that crop today. You'll um, look at the weather data and say, well, how much rain occurred in the last three weeks and what's the forecast next week? And then the step, the app says, well, what's the forecast after that? But it doesn't put much emphasis on that because obviously that data is pretty um, hazy. And from all that information, it will then predict how much sclerotinia is going to occur. And then in the app, you can put in your fungicide options and it will then predict um, what sort of economic returns you'll get from your fungicide. So sort of wrapping up sclerotinia, it is a very hard disease. You as the agronomist have to have some idea whether your crop and your paddock is at risk or not. 
But once you've made that decision, the app is a very, very good spray decision tool which you can use right there and then while standing in the paddock or um, with your client, et cetera. So now we'll really move on to Blackleaf, which is really um, my area of work. So with Blackleaf, we're really talking about three different types of disease. And I like to think of them as all quite separately now because they're all quite managed differently. We've got our normal traditional crown canker, which the industry has been dealing with since um, canola first came into Australia. We've got our upper canopy infection, which we've already been working on since about 2015. And then we've got our pot infection. Now, the first thing I want to say is these diseases, it's not a progression. It's not when we get infected as a seed and the disease continues to regress up the plant. These, all the infections you're really seeing are results of new infection each time, each rainfall event from last year's canola stubble. So it's last year's canola stubble which harbours all the fruiting bodies. These release spores every time it rains through and windblown spores. The spores land on our plants, cause the lesions, so it causes necrosis, ne sorry, necrosis, necrosion, um, necrosis, and then it grows from, from that lesion within the vascular tissue down to the crown and causes the crown canker, which you can see in these bottom photos here. The critical point with this infection here, the crown canker, is that it's the infection that occurs on the cotyledons and first three leaves up to five leaves, which causes all the disease you see at the end of the um, year. So it's the seedling infection which causes your crown infection. As you get later into the growing season, like now, for instance, you can see lots of leaf lesions, but those leaf lesions we know doesn't contribute to any more crown canker. And the reason for that is because basically the disease has just got too far to grow to get down to the crown. And by the time it gets there and starts causing that lesion or the necrosis, it's too late, you've already harvested the paddocks, so you get the disease escapes. It's only this early infection, which is why the seed treatments work so well and why you know, impact and furrow, et cetera, work so well. Um, the second part of the disease is what we're calling upper canopy, which is really what we're talking about today. And this is new infections coming from that canola stubble as well. And then the same process is happening. So we're getting our flowers infected, directed lesions onto our stems and branches. But once again, that disease has to grow into the stem has to cause necrosis, has to get into the vascular tissue to cause the yield loss. And that's a really key point because often we'll see all these infections here and think, oh, this is really bad. And then we'll say, well, there was no yield loss. And that's because the disease hasn't had time to get inside to that vascular tissue to cause the damage. So in many ways, it's very, very similar to the crown canker. Leaf lesions don't, they're very visual, but they're not causing any yield loss. It's the crown canker that's causing yield loss and the same with the upper canopy. The third one is the pot infection. And again, that's new infections from canola stubble. Um, and that's just direct infection up onto the pods, which cause lesions. Those lesions will cause, you know, the seeds underneath that lesion to swivel and fall out of the back of the header, will cause pods to shatter. Um, and that, if you retain that seed, that will actually cause seeding blight the next year. So critically with upper canopy and crown canker, the thing I like to say is as an agronomist, which disease are you going to be controlling this particular year? So it's unlikely you're going to be controlling them both um, just because they work the way they work. Um, in 2023, there's a lot of actual paddocks which will be one or the other. So we're going to be controlling both this year. And the reason for that is if you look at here, these are our months of the year. And in the green here, we've got our spore release or our infection period. So it's really... Blackleg being a fungal disease, it really needs those high levels of moisture. So the way I see it is that our infection period is really late May through to the end of August. And if your plants are growing, which most plants are, during that time of the year, they're going to get blackleg. But we also get a lot of disease escape. So if we sow early, for instance, here we're sowing in April, early May, we actually get our seedlings up, establish a nice warm soils, and they start growing and they're already becoming established before that infection period occurs. So as I said before, if you can get through that third leaf growth stage, subsequent infection after them actually results in very low levels of crown canker. So we sow early, get our crops established early before the winter, and we avoid crown canker. However, on the flip side, we sow early, we get our crops established early, it means we're flowering early. If we're flowering in late July, early August, 
We're still in that infection period, and um, that's when we fall into this upper canopy trap. On the flip side, if we sow late, we're sowing late, our seedlings are now germinating into the infection period. They are sitting there in cold, wet winter conditions, getting spores landing on them every day during that cotyledon one, two leaf stage. And that's when we seal the crown canker. The positive on that one is we don't start flowering until late August, early September, and we get no upper canopy at all. In fact, I've seen them where we've sown susceptible cultivars late and um, canola on canola, very low resistance, and we still don't see any disease because that disease that turns up just simply doesn't have enough time to cause any, um, any yield loss. So know which disease you're dealing with. Have I germinated early? Am I flowering early? I'm going to be controlling upper canopy and I don't have to worry about crown canker or I've sown late, I've germinated late, I've got lots of disease on my seedlings, I have to control crown canker, but I'll be free of um, upper canopy. And this is really critical, I think, even you know, with our fungicide management. So we're not accidentally putting fungicides on when we don't need them. We really know what disease we're chasing. We know what the situation is, and we're really targeting that. So Blackleg, where are we at? We've made enormous progress over the last 20 years. Um, we've got a fantastic understanding of the pathogen, the way the pathogen evolves, what resistance genes it's attacking. We've got a fantastic plant genetics, our Blackleg, Ratings now that we have available to us are completely superior to what they had in the past. You know, this has really resulted of a lot of um, private um, investment with all the different seed companies all doing things slightly differently. We're getting a lot of really good genetics coming through and they're all quite diverse. Obviously, there's been an enormous investment in fungicides. We've got excellent fungicide options now so that when blackleg does become severe, instead of just sitting back and watching our plants die, we can pull the fungicide trigger and protect their crops and still get excellent yields. As I said, we're getting a much better handle on sowing times and flowering times and what effect that, that has been. So it's an amazing story because like if we had the technology we had 20 years ago, there's no way we could have the size of the canola crop that we've got today. It's, it's a real testament, I guess, to the whole industry and the growers, agronomists, everyone, the way it's been managed that we can have a crop that's so large and yet be getting relatively low levels of disease and yield loss. It's um, a fantastic story. For the issues, we know the pathogen continues to degrade our cultivar resistance and, and also and reduce our fungicide efficacy. And the, the reason for that is that because it's a sexually reproducing pathogen, it's got windblown spores, it evolves really, really quickly. So the more you grow a particular cultivar, the quicker that resistance is lost. And we generally see we get good three years use of a good cultivar. And then after that, we will see the major genes either being overcome or the quantitative resistance um, being eroded. And that's one of the reasons you'll see um, canola companies changing cultivars very regularly because they are very much monitoring all this. And when they see their cultivars losing resistance, more lesions turning up, bigger effects on fungicides, ideally they'll pull that cultivar off the market and replace it with a cultivar which has um, got a better black leg resistance rating again. So that's one of the reasons you see cultivars being changed so regularly. We've got to get better up here with our upper canopy blackling management, which we're about to talk about. Fungicide deployment is tricky because fungicides always control disease, but with black leg disease doesn't always control, um, doesn't always cause yield loss. There's a lot of timing effects that go into that. So you can put your fungicide on, you can have beautifully clean leaves, beautiful clean flowers, um, but actually get no economic return. So upper canopy. Key thing with upper canopy is the date to first flower. So what I see here is if we can have crops flowering in July, August or September, the blackleg symptoms on those crops can look exactly the same. However, when we flower in July, the disease has got lots of time to get down to that vascular tissue and cause yield loss. In April, we still see that same process occurring, but much less severe. So in August, it just like just April, August. And then in September, we can see the same process, but we've never really managed to measure any yield loss at all. So the plant just basically is ready for harvest before the disease has the chance. So that date to first flower is absolutely critical. The next thing with upper canopy is we know our major genes are totally effective against black plague at all um, parts of the plant life stage. So um, if those genes are effective, you won't see any leaf lesions and you won't see any flower infections and you won't see any upper canopy responses. 
Um, if those genes are not effective, that's where you see all the leaf lesions and flower infection, and that's where you'll know that the disease can get in and cause that damage. So, for instance, in Australia, the cultivars all have resistance groups now, and you can look at those resistance groups, and in most regions, anything with a H in it um, is likely to look like this, not in all regions, but in most regions, that's certainly the case. Um, and some of the ones which you've got multiple groups, A, B, D, F, et cetera, will also have that effect. But from your perspective, you can look at the resistance groups, have an idea whether it should be resistant or not. Um, but then you can walk into your paddock and you can just look at it. And if you start to see this effect and you're a group H cultivar, you can be pretty confident you don't need to apply a fungicide. If you're a straight group A, B, A, B, that type of resistance, and you're seeing all these leaf lesions, then you can be confident that maybe a fungicide this year might be a good option. So really like the apps. We've um, last year produced the UCI Blackleg app and it's a very simple app. It's a bit like the Sclerotinia app. It um, is a really spray decision tool. The first part of the app is the same as the Blackleg CM app where you put in, you know, what's your target yield, how far away you from canola stubble, rainfall, those sorts of things. And it predicts from that what your disease pressure is. It then, you from an upper canopy perspective, you click on, do I have lesions on leaves? Um, and that's really an indication of, is that major gene resistance effective or not? If you don't have lesions, you're not going to get upper canopy. If you do have lesions, then you're potentially in the susceptible window. You then, same as the Ginny app, you put, what is the growth stage today? What is the growth stage? Where, what date did first flower occur? And then it puts you into a risk category and then you can put in your fungicide options and it will, it will spit out um, what, the, um, you know, what the potential yield loss is and um, what potential yield um, gain will be made by applying fungicides. So you can see in this instance, I put this through in Horsham. I've said it's going to flower on the 1st of August. I've said it's grown right next to the last year's canola stubble and it's predicting around about a 20% yield loss from blackleg. But this is, I guess, the interesting part. I've done and left everything exactly the same now in the app. And I said, now the date of first flower is first of September. And you can see there is zero effect now from a fungicide because we expect there to be no yield loss from black leg at all. And I think this is one of the reasons why people see such variable responses to fungicides and upper canopy is that the crops go from being totally susceptible at the end of July, if they flower at the end of July, to basically completely resistant by September. So that five or six week period, basically all that disease risk completely disappears. So where you fall, where rainfall events fall and that within that period will then determine how much you get. But I think it's really good to know that it really is a steep decline. So your crops haven't flowered right now, you know, on the 9th of August or whatever it is, your risk from upper canopy is reducing pretty much every day at the moment. The next complication is that from a blackleg rating perspective, we now know that there's also an effect. So previously we'd said, and as the app still says, if you have major gene resistance, that's the only resistance you need to think about. If you don't have major gene resistance, if you do have leaf lesions, all cultivars are equally susceptible. The work we've been doing with GFC over the last five years has actually shown that's not the case. The cultivars with the same blackleg resistance groups, so these are two different group B cultivars in our lab-based or glasshouse-based studies have shown very different levels of upper canopy infection. So we know that our quantitative resistance is also having an effect. And the quantitative resistance is a bit like the blackleg ratings. It's are you an MRMS or are you an MR or an RMR, et cetera. So it's that additive type of resistance. We know that's having an effect. We've tried that in the field um, over across all four canola growing states over the last two years. And what we've seen is that where we've classified these cultivars with low resistance, we get a bigger return from a fungicide than if we um, classify them with a higher resistance, which shows that that resistance is actually working and robust in the field. So at the moment, we're working with biometricians, et cetera, to try and put together a blackleg rating system for upper canopy. And when we have that, that will make um, your life so much easier. So you can say, well, this cultivar is an MR, for upper canopy and therefore it is likely to respond this way to a fungicide, whereas this cultivar is an MRMS, um, it's much more likely to get a yield response, et cetera. So that data I hope is coming and I really hope that we'll have it ready for you for next year.
So we're just a um, couple of photos now of what we're seeing right now. So I took these photos last year. We've got um, a lot of our work in the next five years is moving from the glass house into small plots into farmers' fields to try and get a lot of actual real-life data on how upper canopy is working and spray decisions. So this is a photo of us putting our weather stations out last week. And the point I want to make here is this is in the Wimmera. We've got crops right now which are very vegetative. They didn't germinate to later. And obviously you can see that this crop has got no risk whatsoever for upper canopy and you would never have to worry about this because it's going to be flowering late um, and it's going to avoid that disease. We've also got a lot of crops now which have got the major gene effect, things like Fiji with that straight group H. Um, again, you can look at them, they're perfectly clean, they're flowering, they're hitting the, the target for the maturity, but they don't have any um, lesions, so again, they're safe. And then we've got things like these, which are the group B hybrids, really high yielding, great cultivars, coming into flower, and you look at the leaves and they're totally um, colonized by lesions. And I actually had a look yesterday and started to see the first flowers being affected as well. So really, these are the types of crops which I'd be then turning on the app, going through that process and then determining whether I'm going to put um, a spray application on them. So from that, I think it's reasonably clear which crops you want to be targeting. Now becomes the hard part. This is um, just downloaded this this morning. This is from the Bureau of Meteorology. What's the chance of exceeding median rainfall for August, October this year? And the Bureau is coming out now being fairly bullish and saying that it's going to be a very hot, dry spring, basically. Um, and that blackleg being a, 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 a pathogen, um, a fungus needs that moisture. So that's going to drive two things. Firstly, it's going to mean that there's fewer infection events over the next few weeks. Um, so potentially lower disease pressure, lower risk. It's obviously going to potentially mean we have lower yield, so lower economic returns from a fungicide. But on the other side, it can actually be quite bad for disease as well, because we do know that the same amount of disease causes different levels of yield loss depending on how the season plays out. So if you've got a plant with say 10% infection, and then you have a cool, moist spring and the plant's under no stress, you can still suck up as much moisture as it wants and it's not no hot days which are stressing it, it can tolerate that 10% disease, for instance. However, if you have a year with a really hot, dry finish and you've got 10% you know, damage of your vascular tissue, all of a sudden that can actually result in a much higher yield loss. So this is really swings and roundabouts. The lower rainfall now will actually result in less chance of infection, but lower, lower rainfall as the spring progresses could actually exasperate the amount of disease and the yield loss that it causes. So obviously none of us can look into the future. We can't actually, you know, with any confidence work out what's going to happen. However, it's something when you're talking with your farmers and clients, whether they're going to spend that money or nothing or not, they've really got to keep that in mind about potentially what the spring may or may not do. One of the things I also like to look at is um, if you didn't spray your paddock and you want to know, should have I sprayed it, how do I go out and look to see if upper canopy was damaging? As I said, we see a lot of lesions, you know, affected flowers or whatever, which may not affect um, the yield. But one of the things, the two symptoms which I think are quite reliable, one is I call darker branches. So if you're coming just before wind rowing and your stems should still be nice and green and you see these prematurely darkened stems and you can see them in the crop quite clearly, that's an indication that those individual branches have prematurely matured and that's where we can measure the yield loss. And that's quite reliable. And the other method is to get your secateurs or a knife, start cutting plants, slicing them open and looking for that black and pith. That's the other indicator. So they're the two real ones that I use now for determining was um, the upper canopy severe enough to cause yield loss. Now, as I said, this has been a fungicide talk. So we're going to talk a little bit now, just three or four slides on fungicide resistance. So here at Horsham, one of the work, one of the processes we developed is a screen for looking at proportion of isolates which have overcome our fungicides. So for example here, we grow um, the same cultivar in punnets treated with different fungicides. Um, we then suspend canola stubble from an individual paddock above those punnets 
and we allow the spores to rain down on those um, plants. So we can release millions of spores in a single event. And then we can look at the results. Obviously, you can see here in Untreated, the black legs killing the cotyledons. We can see here where we've used an SDHI, new chemistry. We've got completely clean cotyledons, so that chemistry in that situation is completely effective. Where we've used some of our older DMIs, we're seeing somewhere in between the two. So we've seen some indication that some of the spores out of these populations have been able to overcome that DMI um, fungicide and reduce the efficacy of the fungicide. So we've screened around 300 paddocks now for all the, um, all the fungicides which are available on the market at the moment. And you can see here, when we look at our DMI, so you know, these technologies have been around for over 20 years now, um, the purple there is um, the incidence of paddocks which have got high levels of, um, of um, resistance to the fungicides, the moderates and lows. And you can see, obviously, here with the DMIs, we're seeing a lot of noise in those black leaf populations showing that they do have some ability to overcome those fungicides. When we look at the new ones, the SEHIs, um, we've seen no real instances at all. So they are still totally perfectly intact at the moment. The veritas there is an interesting one. We have seen some noise. Now, when we've taken off the um, isolates and tested them, we think that's all from the tebiconazole side, not from the zoxytrobin. So that is good news. Um, so we think that the veritas is still perfectly fine in the field, but we do start to see some of that noise from the tebiconazole. The interesting thing with this is, and when I say we here, I'm talking about my colleagues in Melbourne Uni, so Angela Vanderwell and um, Alec McCullum have done this work. So one of the things they've done now is developed molecular markers for the mutants within these populations, which allow them to attack. Um, and because although we know that these individual paddocks can attack in that glasshouse screen, we don't know what proportion of isolates within that population carry the mutant and we don't know how many they actually need to create field failure. So this doesn't really relate to field failure. So that's what we're working on at the moment. So as I said, now they've got molecular markers for those, um, for the, for those uh, mutants. And with that, they screen 12 of those stubbles or 12 paddocks. And the frequency of those resistant mutants has ranged from 0.5% to 32%. And the work they're doing now is trying to work out what percentage you actually need to get to field failure. And the preliminary data we've had so far suggests that you need around 5% of isolates to carry that mutant to cause a field failure. So this is really, really sort of world-class and first, um, first notion of this stuff. So as I said, the preliminary experiments that we've done, the methodologies have been set up, the markers are now available. So over the next couple of years, Alex doing his PhD on this, and we will try and get a really good idea of how quickly these mutants are growing in our populations and um, we'll actually be able to tell you also whether you, if you send stubble to us, not only will tell you if there's actually resistance there, yes or no, we'll actually be able to tell you what the frequency is and whether that frequency is likely to result in field failure or not. So that, that's pretty neat work. So finally finishing up um, from a fungicide resistance perspective, firstly, I guess the best thing is to control fungicide resistance is to not use a fungicide. So it's to use things like cultivar resistance, separating your crop from last year's stubble, and then really going through what we've been talking about today, using those apps to say, is this crop susceptible? And should I pull the trigger and put a fungicide on? Or no, I think this crop's safe and I don't need that fungicide. So less fungicide use is always going to result in lower um, risk of getting resistance. But other than that, you can jump on the Crop Life website here and it's very self-explanatory. You can go through your different growth, your different application timings and just follow the columns down and it will give you what your options are and remove the options if you've done, if you've um, if they don't exist. But basically, the story that we have, and if we go back to the beginning of my talk, we said upper canopy and crown canker are different infection events because they're both resulting from um, different spores coming from the stubble. So Really, our advice is don't put the same group on twice in succession. So if you're controlling crown canker and used a um, SEHI on your seed as like a salt tray, don't come back with an aviator at the four to six leaf stage. So that's two SEHIs for crown canker. But if you've used a salt tray for your seed and you haven't put a fungicide on the four to six leaf, then you can still use a Moravis or an aviator for the upper canopy because they're two different diseases 
and it's not the same disease group progressing at the plant. So that's really the way I think you want to look at it is one application of one, risk, one fungicide group for the crown and the same for the upper canopy. Um, so with that, I'll leave that back to you, Sheree, and I can take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for uh, what has really been, I think, just an amazing uh, webinar. Um, I've definitely learned a lot here, and I'm sure that our um, participants have as well, even if it's just something to take away and hopefully apply um, in our respective fields. So thank you very much, Steve. I have noticed that we do have a question that's come through for you. Um, it says here, do you need to wait for major gene resistance to fail before you can determine resistance to UCI? The answer to that is yes. So if your major gene are effective, um, your crop is immune to upper canopy and in fact immune to all forms of black leg, and your black leg rating that you see in the rating guide will be an R, that major gene we know will fail because it's happened to every single major gene we've ever had. And when it fails, that's when you will see the quantitative resistance below that. Um, and we hope that all those cultivars have got some quantitative resistance. So when that major gene fails, that cultivar may fall to an MR, for instance. Um, but we don't know what that new black leg rating will be until that major gene fails. So yes, that's correct. So one of the things there, we do have 32 monitoring sites right around the country with GRC Fund. Um, so since we've had those sites, when these major genes have failed, we've managed to pick it up very quickly and feed that information back to the seed companies, et cetera, so they can make sure those cultivars are still okay or remove them from the market. Thank you, Steve. I don't think we've got any other questions at the moment. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to obviously make everyone aware that on your screen right now, you can see our links. Um, you can at hashtag Afrin for Twitter, afrin.com.au, which is our website. Um, also, I would just like to say thank you to the team at Ag Communicators, so Bridget and David, um, for organizing this webinar. And finally, if you could please have a look at the chat box, there is a survey that's gonna hit you there, um, where we really would like to receive your feedback on how you found the session. Thank you again, Steve. Um, for all your help here and, and, you know, making this, you know, an area that I guess we just are more familiar with because you are there, you, you, you know what's happening. Um, and obviously for many of us and especially our farmers, our agronomists and so forth, you know, it's, it's always good to keep this knowledge up to date. So thank you very much. And finally, uh, from the team here at Afrin, we thank you for joining us today. Take care and we hope to see you soon at one of our future Afrin events. So thank you very much.